Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 33 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. When you think about George Washington, what images come to mind? Washington the general? President? Leader? Perhaps the gentleman farmer of Mount Vernon? Have you ever thought about Washington the reader? Today we chat with Douglas Bradburn, the founding director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington, which serves as the George Washington Presidential Library. During our conversation, Doug helps us paint a different mental image of George Washington, an image that includes his reading habits and his love for books. As we converse, Doug reveals why the Mount Vernon Ladies Association founded the George Washington Library, which opened in 2013, the work presidential libraries undertake, and the challenges the George Washington Library deals with as a private presidential library. And details about George Washington, his reading habits, and his estate, Mount Vernon. Let's go and meet Doug. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Douglas Bradburn serves as the founding director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington at Mount Vernon. He has published numerous articles and a book, The Citizenship of Revolution, Politics and the Creation of the American Union, 1774 to 1804. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Doug. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me, Liz. So you are the founding director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington. Would you just tell us a bit about yourself and what kind of work you do as the founding director at the Washington Library? Yeah, thank you. So, you know, I'm a, my background is as an academic. I was a history professor at SUNY Binghamton University for many years. And as you say, I've written uh, a book on the founding era. I've done other work in that period and, and was completely content as a professor there. And I was approached by George Washington's Mount Vernon which is operated by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association here in Virginia, uh, about the possibility of coming on as the first head of a presidential library for George Washington. And uh, as an expert in the founding era, I just felt like it was an opportunity that I I wanted to take on to be able to sort of reach out to different audiences uh, than the academic world and and teach people about the significance of history, but also help create a new research uh, library and research institute, you know, which is focused on early American history. So uh, it was a great opportunity for me. The type of work I do here is is it really exciting. It spans the spectrum of education. We are, as a research library, we do see ourselves as a presidential library, but we're a little different because we're not managed by the National Archive System. We are run by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, which has been uh, running uh, the Mount Vernon Estate since the 1850s when the women put this institution together, this great organization that really created historic preservation in America. And it's an extraordinary story because it was all built by women who at the time, of course, couldn't really own property in their own right, but yet were able to raise the money to save the mansion of George Washington and his tomb uh, and make it available for people to visit. Uh, By the late 1990s, uh, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association wanted to become more potent as an educational institution themselves, so they raised the money. They raised $110 million to build a a museum and education center, which they opened for all visitors to, to see, and that opened in 2006. And then on the heels of that, they wanted to try to create this library for George Washington uh, and they raised $106 million to build the building and endow its program. So uh, it, it's really a, 
an exciting new institution that is still collecting materials. It's sponsoring scholarship. It's bringing teachers here and helping develop materials for teachers all over the country. And it has leadership programs for government uh, people, uh, military groups, uh, corporate groups uh, to come through here as part of their professional development. Uh, to really gain insights and inspiration from the leadership of George Washington. Now, the Washington Library opened in late September 2013. Would you tell us why it took so long to establish a library for George Washington? I mean, don't all presidents have presidential libraries? Well, that's a good question. All presidents do not have presidential libraries. The presidential library system was created in the 1950s, I believe, or maybe the late 40s. Uh, by Congress, which basically said that all presidents' papers are the property of the American people, and they go to the National Archives, but they're going to be managed in these different presidential libraries for presidents going forward. And then they established as well some uh, some presidential libraries for people in the uh, you know in the 20th century before Roosevelt. Uh, so you know Wilson has a, a, a presidential library that's partially managed by the National Archives system as well. But uh, presidents, you know, before that don't really have presidential libraries. I mean, there's a couple of other private examples like ours. There's the Jefferson Library at Monticello. There's the Springfield uh, Library for uh, Abraham Lincoln. But in general, no, uh, presidents don't have presidential libraries. So in that sense, it's unique. Um, But it is certainly overdue, I think. Uh, The presidency of George Washington is certainly one of the most important because it's the first, and it was the creation of the model that would stand uh, for what a president could and should be and how the executive office should be run. And so it was essential there. Uh, You know, I described why it's here because of the vision of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association and their desire to help educate people, not only who come to the estate, but really all over the world about George Washington. Uh, They would say that it is uh, what George Washington would have wanted. Because when he came back to Mount Vernon after his two terms as president in 1797, he wrote a letter uh, really within the first month of him being back uh, to James McHenry, who was the Secretary of War under John Adams, writing that uh, although there was lots more work to do at Mount Vernon, he had only one house to build, and that was a house to house his military, private, and uh, public papers, which, as he said, were voluminous and maybe interesting. And uh, I think you'll agree that uh, Washington's papers certainly are interesting, and and he wanted to build that place that housed them and house his legacy, uh, but uh, he wasn't able to do that before he passed away. And so the Mount Vernon Ladies Association would would argue that they're fulfilling the general's uh, wishes in in creating uh, this great library for Washington here at Mount Vernon. Washington was a leader. I mean. He set precedents for the way our president should act. Some of those precedents still exist today. Does being a unique private library outside of the National Archives Records Administration give you the opportunity to do some unique things that would allow Washington's library to lead in his footsteps? Well, I think the question relates really to uh, you know what we can do to help people understand that legacy. So the mission of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association generally is to teach people about the life leadership and legacy of George Washington. And I think that as a a library devoted to him and his era, really, uh, we can help focus that, uh, that magnifying glass on the crucial significance of the founding of the United States and George Washington's role in that story. You know, so we have the ability here to bring fellows, academic fellows who are, you know, PhD candidates and recent graduates and professors who are here, you know, working on the projects that they're, you know, working on related to early American history. We have the ability to bring teachers here from across the country to focus on the founding and help them understand Washington's uh, crucial role. Uh, We have the ability to bring different private groups through here, you know, without uh, having to deal with all the sort of government regulations with that to deal with, you know, to help educate people on, on Washington's um, leadership. You know, I think we have some challenges because we're private, and which means we don't have an inexhaustible source of money. Uh, we don't have the taxpayers behind us to help us, you know, purchase the rare materials of Washington's that are still coming up for auction. And I'd say we are taking a leadership role there and trying to preserve the, the heritage of some of these things. And I'll just give you an example of a couple of ways. The 
But there's still items that are undocumented that come up for auction. So these are items that aren't known to the Papers of George Washington Project. This is a project in Charlottesville and here at the Washington Library, which is, uh, you know, transcribing, professionally annotating all the manuscripts and correspondence of George Washington. But sometimes uh, even we and they don't know about items that exist until they come up for auction or in, in private hands. And our goal really is to try to get every undocumented item of Washington uh, into the library. And in the last year, there's, you know, there's been a number of really exciting pieces that have come up that people didn't know existed. And we were able to purchase them at auction and now make them available for researchers and really protect them in, in perpetuity. Uh, I would say also that because we are focusing so closely around the story of George Washington in the founding, we can really fill in the social context of his life, including all the enslaved people who labored here at Mount Vernon, uh, the Martha Washington story and, and her family, so the, the story of the community, uh, the family, uh, the, the local area in a way that's very rich and necessarily significant because of its connection to the, the sort of foundation foundational uh, moments uh, of American history. So we we do, you know, we have a nice focus and can bring out the life legacy of Washington, but we can do it in a way that's really well-rounded and, and really kind of shows that, you know, he, he lived in a world that was, uh, you know, made up of all sorts of people that made his life uh, possible. Now, you've mentioned that you have acquired some some rare materials and undocumented mm -hmm. materials. What types of yeah. books, documents, and materials will we find when we visit the Washington Library the next time we're at, at Mount Vernon? Oh, great. So thank you for that question. Uh, well, first off, let's, it's a, a research library. So it'll have all the, uh, the electronic databases that are all up to date for the, you know, for an early American, as certainly who would go to do research here, a uh, genealogist or someone just interested in, you know, in, in learning more about the founding era. So our, our circulating collection, our secondary book collection is very strong in the founding era, but also in historic preservation uh, and decorative arts as well, which is crucial to what our curatorial staff and our archaeology staff and all the other great people at Mount Vernon who, who work on the estate need to, to do their job. So it's it, first and foremost, it's a kind of a great uh, research library that focused around the founding era. Now, when you get into the rare books and manuscripts, uh, we have, in terms of manuscripts, we have a great collection of George Washington materials, particularly related to the Chesapeake, to Mount Vernon as well. Uh, this is manuscript materials. We have his account books. We have his financial records. And this is state, uh, really, all the ancillary documentation. This is probably the best documented 18th century plantation uh, when you when you look at the combination of the written records as well as the archaeological record and the the actual you know the building record and the landscape of any in I would say probably the Western Hemisphere and it is so it's an extraordinary resource for the social history of the times itself and that's reflected in in our manuscript collection. Uh, in addition to Washington, we have Martha Washington, a lot of her descendants' papers, Bushrod Washington, who was a Supreme Court justice for. 30 years, who was the person who inherited Mount Vernon from George Washington. We have also an assorted uh, historical manuscript collection of various items related to the Revolution, uh, which we are still really developing great finding aids for, as it is our you know, opening season still, really. And then if you look at the library itself, the books, uh, the, the rare books, we have a tremendous collection of Washington books. So these are books that he owned, that he accumulated. Uh, we have over 102 volumes of his uh, of his library that he had when he died. He had about 900 volumes when he died. And then we have another 600 odd duplicate editions of volumes that are the same edition of books that we know he owned, um, but they aren't the actual you know volume that he had here at Mount Vernon. But they are 18th century books, and so. Uh, it's really a great uh, resource to look at the mind of the man himself. Uh, and then finally, I would say one of our great resources is our archive of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. It's probably one of the most untapped women's history archives that exist. This is, a, again, an organization that was all run by women and still is for over 160 years continuously. We have their records as they've struggled to you know, really uh, build the story of historic preservation, help Americans understand their their heritage. So there's a lot of great uh, projects still to be written uh, in that archive, uh, and that's all here at Mount Vernon.
Now, you mentioned that you have, what was it, 102 or 120 of yes. Washington's books? 102 volumes, yes, about 60 titles. Where did the rest of the collection go? Is it intact or is it scattered? It is scattered, as George Washington papers generally are. So when he died, uh, his uh, his estate and his library and his papers were inherited by Bushrod, the aforementioned Bushrod Washington. Uh, Bushrod is, uh, you know, it's not somebody I would consider a great steward. Uh, he uh, he ended up giving away a lot of the papers to John Marshall, to Jared Sparks, and in the process of this, uh, some of them got destroyed, some of them got lost, some of them got changed. Uh, then ultimately, the, the manuscripts were, you know, spread all over the place until the bulk of them. I would say probably half of all the known Washington documents are in the Library of Congress now. Uh, that didn't happen for really about 100 years after Washington's death. And the, similarly with the books. Now, books were even of less interest for people to collect. And, and so of the 900-odd volumes that were here when he died, you know, that collection was ultimately broken up and sold in different chunks from different members of the family. There's about 300, maybe more, volumes at the Boston Athenaeum, actually, of uh, Washington's library. Uh, the people of Boston in the 1840s learning that a large portion of George Washington's library was going to be sold to the British Library of all places, who were expanding their Americana collection. Uh, they they uh, got the money together to save that uh, that library, uh, and uh, and now it's in the Boston Athenaeum. There's books at the Huntington Library. There's books really all over uh, the country. But we have a, a really uh, large collection of them, and we're delighted to have what we have. I guess that's a benefit of the presidential library system we have today is that these things may not get as scattered right. as much as they did during Washington's that's time. That's the idea of it, right. So this is the, the record, and the, the papers are really are, they're the property of the people of the United States. So they all have to be turned over and managed by the National Archive system. That wasn't the case until well into the 20th century. So, yes, we've lost a lot of uh, – of the, you know these early presidents probably because of that, but uh, but it's great. I mean Washington, I think unlike even some you know, certainly lesser known 18th century figures, this stuff is scattered. But the great thing is people tend to hang on to it. You know they they have revered it in their families or they believe it's valuable in some way. And so Washington items still are coming up. It's 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 really um, amazing to me as a historian. I thought you know all this stuff was kind of known, and and so it is. Uh, it is uh, fun to to to, uh, to get those things back here. So, what type of books did George Washington like to read? Did he did he and Martha have a favorite book? <laughs> That's a great question, difficult question. Um, Washington is really fascinating to look at through the story of his library and his reading because he didn't have a formal education. You know, unlike uh, Jefferson. Uh, for instance, uh, he, in sense, he's he's more like Franklin, although he's not, you know, a, a, a genius in that sense. Washington had reading, writing, and arithmetic when his father died when he was 11 years old, and so he didn't inherit a bunch of books. He didn't buy a large library of someone else. He really built his library over the course of his life. So what you see uh, through an analysis of it and how he put it together is he's really he's really buying books as he feels like he needs them. So. He has reading, writing, arithmetic. To that, he adds surveying. And as an early surveyor, 16, 17 years old, the earliest books he's buying are books on mathematics and on geography. Uh, he's a colonel of the Virginia Regiment when he's 23 years old, and he starts, you know, he's doing it in the field, but he's also acquiring books on how to arrange uh, troops in the field, how to set up a camp, the art of military affairs. These are all things he's buying, you know, as he's uh, as he's learning. Uh, similarly with agriculture, he grows up on a farm, becomes a major planter, but he's always buying the latest books on agricultural techniques. And I think in general, you would say that he enjoyed reading about agriculture more than anything, or at least he certainly was an avid reader of agricultural books. We know he took extensive notes on different agricultural books. Varlow on husbandry is a, is a good example. I don't know the full title. Jethro Tull is another one. Uh, not the band, but the uh, the agriculture reformer, uh, and uh, you know I would you know he often references Shakespeare, so he clearly has read his Shakespeare. He references Cato, the play by Joseph Addison, uh, which is something of importance to him. He, he quotes it throughout his life. Uh, so there are kind of clear leaders. You know he did mention that the Federalist Papers he thought were the greatest treatises on uh, political 
science. Uh, you know, so he, he gives us little hints here and there. But I, I would dare say there's not one book I would say, oh, this is the one he went to over and over again. And you know, from his library, he clearly knew his Bible. Um, there were some pocket manuals on military affairs that he certainly had with him in the field. There's a great letter uh, by William Fairfax, Colonel William Fairfax, during the French and Indian War, who describes Washington as having Caesar's commentaries with him on the frontier of, uh, you know, during the front, while he's trying to organize the defense of the Virginia frontier during the French and Indian War, which I always find a really evocative notion of, uh, you know, Caesar's commentaries on Gaul and, and, and Washington out there dealing with the troubles he had with the local population and also with Native Americans, you know, in, during the war itself, there were a lot of uh, parallels with what Caesar was writing about. So, you know, Washington was a reader, and uh, and he encouraged his officers to read and to better themselves through reading. Uh, and so that's that's clearly something I don't think most Americans, you know, uh, know as much about Washington as a reader. He, he was, you know, an Enlightenment man, although not sort of a philosoph uh, like, uh, like a Jefferson. I imagine that Washington's interest in books about agriculture and agriculture in general must have been inspired for his love for his estate, Mount Vernon. So yeah. would you tell us about Mount Vernon, such as how Washington came to own the estate, what sorts of right. buildings he built, and what types of activities he performed to earn a living? Sure. Um, thank you. Yeah, so the estate was very important to understanding who he was and and he was certainly in love with agriculture. It was the one area he believed he could make a mark that would have an impression. He hoped he could add something to, you know, American civilization, essentially, you know, through bettering practices of agriculture and husbandry. And that came through a long life of experience of farming in the Chesapeake, really in different parts of the Chesapeake. So George Washington uh, didn't inherit the estate until after his elder half-brother, Lawrence Washington, had passed away. Uh, Lawrence was given it in their father's will. Uh, you know, the, the land had actually been, you know, given to Washington way back in the 17th century. Uh, and Augustine Washington, George's father, had planted a, a little house here to kind of claim the estate. But he had uh, not grown up at Mount Vernon. He'd grown up at Ferry Farm in Fredericksburg. So his half-brother gets the estate, but he dies in 1752. But after his death... And then, you know, it was inherited from uh, to uh, Lawrence's widow, Anne Fairfax, who uh, who basically rented the estate to George Washington in 1754. And unfortunately, uh, uh, she died and her and Lawrence's daughter died as well uh, in 1760 by 1761. And that's when George Washington really inherited the estate outright. So he started farming it in 1754. Uh, and inherited it outright in 1761. Now, at that time, he brought uh, with him to the estate Martha Dandridge Custis, who had been married to John Custis, Martha Dandridge. Uh, John Custis died. Martha Dandridge was herself only about eight months older than George Washington, but she was a very wealthy widow uh, and uh, very attractive in that regard to George Washington, and it's clear that they went on to have a loving relationship together. Uh, she had two young children, and she had a, a large amount of money that she brought into his uh, estate uh, when they married. Uh, he also had to keep, manage and trust the estate of uh, her children, uh, much of which were down on the York River. So he, all right, so it's the 1760s, and he's basically trying to become a Virginia planter, a planter focused mostly around tobacco. And he very quickly realizes that he can't make tobacco uh, agriculture work uh, on the Potomac River, that the price wasn't good enough for the labor. And uh, and so he had expanded his slaveholding as part of trying to become a tobacco planter as well. And when you have lots of slaves, of course, uh, it's a challenge because, you, you know, they need to be fed regularly, and they need to be clothed, and they need to be housed. And so a large estate has large expenses. Uh, and Washington wanted to make his estate pay, and he wanted to make it grow. And so he was um, investing in a lot of different ways in uh, in Mount Vernon in the 1760s. He transitions to wheat agriculture, which becomes the major cash crop. He also establishes a major fishery so that when the fish are running on the Potomac, he's able to get upwards of a million pounds of shad a year, a million, sh I'm sorry, a million individual fishes a year. 
to that he salts and sells in the West Indies and also is used as uh, food on his estate for the, the enslaved people as well as uh, other people here. Uh, he eventually, by the end, you know, he cultivates orchards and does all, all sorts of, uh, you know, cidering. By the end of his life, he's developed a, a really state-of-the-art grist mill uh, in which he's grinding flour and uh, and eventually, in the last few years of his life, has a distillery, which is producing 11,000 gallons of whiskey uh, a year, making it probably one of the largest distilleries in America at the time. So he's very entrepreneurial because he needs to find ways to raise ready cash, to find ways to make the estate more self-sufficient. By the American Revolution, his estate really is already producing most of the clothing for the people who live here. Uh, you know, uh, based on its own resources. He's constantly experimenting with different kinds of crops. And gradually, particularly after the American Revolution, he, he sees his role as really trying to transform husbandry and agriculture in America to be, in our common parlance today, something more sustainable, uh, something that is more scientific would be the word, scientific farming, uh, in which you have lots of crop rotation. You know, he, he really is enamored with certain kinds of English uh, agricultural forms uh, and trying to bring that to the estate. He hires an English expert in, on English farming. You know, he, uh, you know, he he tries all sorts of other things as well, practicing with different types of crops, et cetera, and, uh, and really trying to create the estate, make the estate into a, a model for people to emulate. Now, that doesn't really happen, uh, but nevertheless, uh, he is engaged in that, in that endeavor throughout his life. So Mount Vernon is sort of the thing that he most likes to do. When he describes who he is, he would describe himself as a farmer. By the 1780s and 90s, he has a long correspondence with Arthur Young in England, who's a leading agricultural reformer. Uh, and so uh, Washington is seen in Europe also as sort of the first in farming, as well as, you know, the great man who led the revolution and gave up power. And don't some of his buildings still operate today? Like, I think I saw your at GW Books Twitter handle or my yeah. friend Kristen D. Burton tweet that you could still purchase some of Washington's whiskey because you make it in the distillery. That's right. Absolutely. Actually, today is April first when we're recording this. We just opened the distillery and grist mill again for general tours, uh, and we do. We produce uh, the the grist mill is a fully functioning grist mill. It has something called the Oliver Evans grinding system in it, which Washington put in uh, really right after he signed the patent. He was the third patent of the United States, and it's a inc- tremendous system that grinds both corn and flour at the same time. And uh, multi, you know, different kinds of fineness of the flour as well. And so we still, you know, get to make our corn meal from uh, corn ground in the grist mill here. Uh, we do sell grits uh, from the grist mill and other things. You can get uh, through Mount Vernon's web page and also whiskey. Um, uh, they began distilling. Uh, so they, the archaeology of recreating the distillery happened in the 1990s and early aughts. They rebuilt the building and have now made it into a functioning 18th century distillery. Uh, and they produce uh, rye whiskey based on George Washington's uh, recipe, as far as we can tell, you know, from because we have the account books of the distillery. We have all the, 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 the different ratios of, of what they used in it. And yes, you can buy that whiskey here on the estate. And I think they just finished doing another batch. Uh, just recently, and they also produced, you know, what we would consider peach stops, and as well as uh, apple brandy in the distillery. It seems, based on what you've said, that Washington would be very proud that the blueprint he laid out for a profitable estate is still working here in the 21st century. Well, you know, if uh, if Washington was able to charge the people that visited him uh, in the you know in the 1780s and 90s, he he it would have been easier for him too. I mean, I think you know we we are a historic home that uh, at, that does get a lot of our revenue from the the wonderful people who come and visit us here. And uh, uh, but you're right. I think that uh, you know we have to be like he because we are fully private and only take you know take money not from the government but from individuals uh you know we have to find ways to raise uh, revenue and uh, and and that's uh, i think he would be tickled that we have some of the same challenges of maintaining the buildings and making sure that uh, you know the personnel are taken care of you know then in, in the you know in the same manner so i do think you know his story of entrepreneurship is one that we can uh people today can readily relate to you know you have to 
you're trying to work to find ways to improve what you've what you've inherited, what you've got, what you've purchased, to, so that it, it can be sustainable. It seems like Mount Vernon played a big role in Washington's life. And I wonder if you think that the setting and activities of Mount Vernon played a role in shaping George Washington into the great yeah. leader that we remember him as today. Well, it's interesting you put it that way because, you know, when we do think of Washington in leadership, you think of the things he does away from Mount Vernon. You know, he's president of the United States when he is uh Commander in Chief of uh, the American, you know, during the American Revolution, he only is back at Mount Vernon for I think three days in the whole course of the war. You know, he's always with the troops; he never leaves their side except on, as he would say, public duty. You know, so yeah, a lot of the kind of dramatic leadership that he displays happens outside of the confines of the estate. But I think the more you look at the man himself and sort of, you know, the the way he led. Uh, certainly, you know, his experience here at Mount Vernon would shape him. I mean, uh, you know, managing the estate itself is crucial, in, you know, in his, his own honing of his abilities to get things done. But I think, you know, we can think of it more, you know, if you look at the ideological transformation of Washington from a loyal Briton to somebody who is concerned about the relationship uh, with Britain and ultimately into, uh, you know, a, 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 an American patriot, uh, you know, his experience with the tobacco system was uh, was certainly something that helped alienate him from Britain. You know, he's tried to make his beautiful, beloved state of Mount Vernon operate, but he really does feel like the system is unjust. Uh, and when you start getting things like the Stamp Act, like the uh, Townsend duties, you know, he and, and George Mason are leaders in the development of the uh, anti-importation agreements. Uh, and he's, you know, and he's because of his experience as, you know, someone trying to make money in agriculture, he very much feels the mercantilist system very powerfully uh, as a limitation and, and fundamentally an unjust system. When you look at his relationship to the Potomac River as well, which he, of course, lived on and I think haunted him in some ways, in the Potomac for him, he always believed would be the great avenue into the interior of America. He had land further up on the Potomac. He had He had uh, interest in land in the Ohio Valley. He believed the Potomac could become this great thoroughfare of commerce, but he also felt like the British imperial system uh, would not allow that uh, possibility to occur. He, he felt like, of course, they were constrained by the proclamation line. They were constrained by, you know, the British restraints on on uh, Virginians' ability to sort of improve, as he would call it, those lands. And then, of course, uh, it's at Mount Vernon he becomes the president of the Potomac Navigation Company after independence. Uh, that the Mount Vernon Compact happens at Mount Vernon, which is crucial as really a commercial treaty between the state of Maryland and the state of Virginia in 1785, which is going to lead directly to the idea of the Annapolis Convention, which leads directly to the Philadelphia Convention, which leads to the effort to create a more perfect union. So Mount Vernon, uh, you know, was a place where Washington you know, honed his leadership abilities, shaped his vision for what the United States could become, and uh, and developed his his truly sort of patriotic attitudes about an American uh, country versus a British one. As you know, there are many books that have been written about George Washington and his deeds. Um, in fact, not so long ago, we spoke to Bob Middlecoff in episode 26 about his recent book, Washington's Revolution. With all of the research and writing that has been done about George Washington, do you know of anything that we don't know about the man? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's, you know, as historians, we're often asked, you know, is there anything new to be discovered? And, you know, that you know, a lot of times you can talk about, you know, there are a lot of obviously stories to be recovered and social context to be properly redrawn, new perspectives to bring to bear. And the same exists for Washington himself. And if you can start with his own family relationships, you know, which in fact, I think even Martha Washington has not really gotten her proper due, you know, as a, such a significant role that she played in the founding of the country, let alone ensuring up this man who, you know, is on the dollar bill and and, uh, and is one of the greatest leaders America has had. She, her story is still, still to be fleshed out, and it's partly her fault. You know, she burned their letters and probably burned their letters. We don't have their letters. Um, but if you look at, like, George Washington's relationship with his brothers, Charles and Samuel, 
Um, nobody really knows much about that. His relationship with his cousins, even, uh, who were important to him. Lund, Washington, managed his estate for a long period. There's other Washingtons that were significant, uh, you know, in the Dismal Swamp Company and things he did with them. There's So there's a lot of sort of the family relationships that are only lightly drawn and poorly uh, understood. And there's still a lot of hoary myths around his relationship with his mother that aren't particularly clear. Uh, so that aspect of Washington, the man, is remains, I think, uh, problematic, difficult to get to. Too many of the books on Washington, even some of the great books on Washington, are content to rest with uh, the sort of received wisdom, you know. And I think that uh, you know some of the great people here at Mount Vernon, you know, Susan Shulwer, who's the curator, Carol Cadu, who's the you know, the head of uh, historic preservation, Esther White, who's the head of archaeology, uh, Mary Thompson, who's a research historian here and have been here for 30 years. I mean, they know things about George Washington that aren't widely known, um, you know, that are of great significance to understanding his perspective. And it is a shame when people don't come to Mount Vernon and come use our resources, both human and otherwise, to try to, you know, to re- try to really understand the particular story they they want to talk about. I'm in the enviable position now where I'm in a vantage point where I, I see a lot of the forthcoming work and people talk to me about, you know, items they're working on. And, you know, there's some books coming out, I think, on George Washington, the sportsman, you know, that aspect of his life are uh, are not well known. But even if you think about it, Liz, I mean, what is the great book on George Washington's first term in office? You know, I, I mean, what is the great book that's been written about George Washington's, you know, uh, you know, ideas of union, you know, through time. I mean, I, I think he hasn't gotten the treatment that a Jefferson has, for instance, as as an, uh, you know, as an important thinker on, on the future of the country, on the character of the country. He still has too much of the work is sort of either a geographic in nature or it's, uh, or it's just, it, it's just too focused on him and not enough on the context, you know. Um, I mean, my God, the stories of him going out into the Ohio Valley at 22, 21 years old to talk to the French and deliver this message from the Virginians that they need to leave. And I mean, that, that story and the Native Americans he ran into there and the people there, it's just a, it's a great story that uh, it's not so much that we don't know it. It's that uh, people don't understand its significance in the context of the British Empire, Native American uh, worlds, the French Empire, you know, he he is uh, he's such a fascinating figure because he he touched so many different aspects of the story. So speaking about all the books out there, if we want to learn about George Washington, what books do you think we should read? I think that if you're somebody who wants to kind of the, the, a definitive biography, so like a thick, if you're one of those people who like to you know have that thick biography that you just love to you know work on, sort of chew on for a while, uh, you know, I you know I definitely. Uh, you know, think Ron Chernow's Washington would be the place to begin. Chernow won the Pulitzer Prize for the biography. He's a brilliant writer. Uh, he used the papers of George Washington Project, so he used the up-to-date stuff. He didn't use, you know, the old stuff uh, that was out there, uh, which some people do. So that's a great place to start. If you want a, a shorter, uh, you know, biography, I think we're still waiting for the perfect short biography on George Washington, but Joe Ellis's His Excellency is a good one um, to work with. I think if you want to look at Washington and the war, you know, Ed Langle's, uh General George Washington is a great way to go. And I think if you want kind of a, a, a new take on an old story um, or, or to rethink kind of an old a, a period in Washington's life that doesn't get a lot of attention, uh, Ed Larson's recent book called The Return of George Washington, which looks at his life really after he gives up power in 1783 and all the way until he becomes the president again in 1789, uh, including his role in bringing about the Constitutional Convention and then what he did at the Constitutional Convention. I mean, Ed Larson's book is really a, a brilliant eye-opener on a, on on a new way to think about it. Uh, Washington as an active uh, politician, as a retail politician as someone with a great vision uh, for the future of the country and as a, as a key, not, and not a, uh, a figurehead uh, player in that great period in time. So that, that would be one I would emphasize as well. Thank you for those recommendations. 
Listener Lamari would like to know how President Washington felt about the plight of the African slaves and the few remaining Native Americans who lived on some of the locations that he visited during his southern tour. And specifically, she really would like to know if Washington's experiences during the American Revolution or as the nation's first president ever changed his feelings or ideas about slaves and Native Americans. Well, Lamari, thank you for the question. It's an important one and a a great one. George Washington grew up, of course, in a time when slavery uh, was the uh, preferred mode of labor in the Chesapeake, uh, where he grew up. He grew up, it was, le- it was, as an institution, the ability to hold people in bondage and hereditary bondage was legal all throughout the Atlantic world, certainly even in Boston, Massachusetts, even in the in the North, um, you know, hereditary-based slavery existed. So it was something that he grew up, you know, as as a... Uh, uh, that was a regular system, and uh, in fact, he inherits uh, men and women when he's 11 years old. When his father dies, he inherits about 10 people that now he is, you know, responsible for. Um, you know, I, I think his, you know, his early mastery is going to have a major impact on his life uh, in that regard. But it's not, you know, it's clear that he doesn't really question it as an institution, or at least we don't have evidence that he's questioning it either as an economic institution or as a moral uh, problem, you know, until he gets much older. You know, he, as I said, he expands his slave owning as he's trying to make Mount Vernon into a tobacco plantation. Uh, we see the first inklings of his, um, uh, a change of mindset coming in the American Revolution itself. So, uh, he comes to believe that um you know that freed blacks need to be in the army need to be allowed in the army uh he comes to in conversations uh with the marquis de lafayette uh with uh the lawrence uh comes to you know think about the uh, the possibility of using even enslaved uh, people in the army and then freeing them afterward uh, he, he certainly writes a letter that he wants to, in his words, quote, get quit of Negroes. He writes that in uh, the 1770s, late 1770s, during the war, but he doesn't really explain what he means by that. It's clear that he he doesn't want to sell men and women anymore by the 1780s. He, he wants to try to never buy any more people and sell any more people. Um, and it's clear, you know, in the 1780s, he, he remarks to the Marquis de Lafayette, Lafayette wants to try... Uh, an experiment of buying a plantation in the West Indies and freeing these slaves there and, and trying to figure out how they could be tenants on that property. And Washington basically says, you know, good luck with that, Marquis. You have, you know, your your sentiments, your, you know, are, are excellent reflection of your nobility. Washington clearly comes to believe that slavery is against the principles of the revolution, but he doesn't have a solution for it by the 1780s. He does say that he wanted it to be ended by legis- what he would call by legislation. And at the time he wrote that, he meant the state of Virginia. This is before the Constitution, uh, and that he would go along with it. But he wasn't, you know, uh, personally, you know, he hadn't really figured out a way out of the system. So then by the end of the 1780s, it's clear that he has some moral questions about the system, you know, and its longevity. He believes that it's economically inefficient, certainly for the kind of uh, husbandry and agriculture he's trying to create, this English-style husbandry. He doesn't need all the labor that he needs under tobacco monoculture. He sees the system as economically inefficient uh, and really burdensome uh, from his point of view. Uh, and uh, and so it's clear at some point in the early 1790s that he probably has has thought that he is going to free the slaves he owns at his death. He doesn't have uh, heirs of his own body, uh, you know. He he uh, therefore has less concern over the inheritance of the you know of his family, uh, even his grandchildren that he would consider his grandchildren, George Washington Park Custis and Nellie Custis. Uh, they have money from the Custis line coming, so. Uh, he attempts at times to buy uh, the slaves who are at Mount Vernon who are going to be inherited through the Custis line that he has no ownership of. They're essentially held by Martha as part of her dowry right, but they aren't. Martha can't get rid of them either. I mean, they, they're going to go to the, the Custises, but the, the Custises refuse to sell to him so that what he ultimately does at his death uh, in his will, he frees all the slaves that he owns outright, about 135 people, you know, uh, that he will, that will be made free at the death of Martha. Uh, and, um, 
And, and, and with that, it's not just a prosaic statement in his will. He actually connects it to a ringing you know, statement of uh, his belief that slavery is against the principles of the American Revolution, that it is uh, you know, morally uh, problematic. And, uh, and he hoped that that statement would have some impact. Now, you know, it would go on and be used by abolitionists, but also George Washington would be held up as, you know, uh, by uh, pro-slavery people as well, as a slave owner that, you know, had had, had held enslaved people his whole life. So, uh, you know, it's a mixed legacy, certainly from our point of view. Uh, it is good to see that, he, you know, he is the only president who had enslaved people that freed them at his death, or in his will, I should say not of his death and his will. Uh, so that's significant. Now, the Native American question is different. I mean, he didn't think about people of color as one group, uh, certainly not at all. I mean, he considered Native Americans in a very different light than um, than people of African descent and, and slaves themselves. Uh, Native Americans he had early contact with. You know, he when he was a 16-year-old on his first surveying mission out west, he saw some Native Americans who were, you know, moving north and south on their own hunting uh, expeditions, and he, he just considered them, you know, outrageous. You know, they were sort of outside of his world, uh, you know, and he, he, but he sort of marveled at them in that way. Um, as a diplomat in his early missions, he had to deal with Native American power uh, on the ground in the Ohio Valley, where, you know, that is Indian country in his youth. That's an area controlled by Native Americans. And however, the, whatever the English want to say and whatever the French want to say, their claims are only as good as their ability to uh, to work with Native Americans can make them. So from an early age, he's dealing with Native Americans as a power uh, to be dealt with. He sees, you know, gradually, you know, as as you know, he sees them as a people that are going to be, you know, sort of naturally pushed west as uh, English um, agriculture goes, because Native American agriculture, he sees it as something that can't exist side by side with more settled agricultural practices. You know, even though, of course, many Native Americans had settled agricultural practices, he has that sort of the prejudice uh, common to Virginians in the 18th century. Then as president, of course, you know, he he uh, he celebrates the allies, to the Oneida that the Americans had during the revolution, uh, Tuscarora, Native, the Catawbas. Uh, he tries to negotiate fair treaties with the Native groups like the Creek and others, and he really comes up against oftentimes uh, frustration within people in the states who want to rather have control of their own Native American policy. Uh, he's engaged in a Native American war uh, in, in during his presidency in the Ohio Valley, which he blames the British for, as many Americans did. Uh, but so that, you know, so he had uh, his attitudes toward Native Americans, I mean, always considered them to be, you know, important, uh, powerful groups, uh, the ones that were outside of the boundaries of the United States. You know, he didn't have a, a kind of a romantic view of, of the Native Americans. He saw them as people who had their own interests just as he did. So, uh, uh, but he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't have any strong, you know, racist, what we would consider racist prejudices either. Let's transition to the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Are you ready for your time warp question? (laughs) I'm ready. Sounds fun. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Okay, so this question is inspired by a tale that many of us New Englanders grow up learning in grade school. And that tale is that Dr. Joseph Warren was such a great leader and that if he had not died at the Battle of Bunker Hill, he would have been the first president of the United States. So, in your opinion, what might have happened if Dr. Joseph Warren had not died at the Battle of Bunker Hill on June 17, 1775? Well, uh Love these counterfactuals, impossible to say, but let me say this. Um, uh, I love the enthusiasm of all the great patriots in New England. Um, the Battle of Bunker Hill is June 17th, 1775. George Washington was commissioned as the commander in chief of that army, the army around Massachusetts. Uh, at least, actually, the, you know, the Continental Congress is taking it over yet, but he's the commander in chief uh, before the battle happens, so he, he still would have been the commander in chief of the army. 
And uh, although you know, many of the New Englanders wanted a New England leader like a John Hancock or perhaps a, uh, a Joseph Warren, uh, in fact, the, the you know picking a Virginian was crucial to keeping that uh, the, the broad base support for the army itself and for uh, extended operations against the British. So I think Washington still would have been that commander in chief. Uh, if Warren would have lived, I mean, I think that Washington would have been delighted to have him as, you know, a, a you know one of the next in command, better than certainly Charles Lee or some of these other people that he had to ultimately deal with and, and was frustrated with. Uh, if Warren was a successful general, uh, my belief is that uh, he would have ended up loving George Washington as much as, you know, uh, the the other generals that Washington served uh, closely with and and under him. Now, whether he would have been the first president or not because of that, I don't know. He still would have had to get around Big George, and uh, that would have been difficult, I think, to do. I, I think, though, maybe the war wouldn't have lasted as long if Warren would have been there uh, to help out, because that uh, that upper level of, of officers you know, had some serious leadership issues that uh, uh, Washington often had to run uh, run around. But um you know, if if Warren would have went on instead of Israel Putnam to be in command at Long Island, perhaps that battle wouldn't have gone so poorly as well. You know, I I, I do think Warren would have want, went on to be a, you know one of the great founders. It's clear that he had the capacity, he had the touch, he had the learning. You know, he, and with the military background, he would have had something that John Adams didn't have. And I, you know, I would, you know, it, he probably could have been the second president instead of John Adams rather than the first president instead of Washington. Well, thank you for being kind to our, our Yankee <laughs> egos. No, no, I think it's a great idea. You know, too many people don't know enough about Warren. And, and uh, you know, he is, you know, some of the lost founders. And you think about who is bust worthy. So we have a, in our library here, we have these busts in the library that represent the founders and they represent them in in 1785. And people like Alexander Hamilton are there, and people like um, you know James Madison are there. But in 1785, if you were to build a library and put busts up, the heroes of the Revolution, Warren would have gotten a bust. Montgomery, Montgomery, yeah, uh, yeah Montgomery would have gotten Montgomery. a bust. He would have gotten a bust. You know, some of these other people who are now long forgotten who died uh, would have gotten busts. And uh, John Paul Jones would have had a bust. We don't have him here. You know, so. Uh, it is a it's a great thing to you know to recognize that we lost uh, some great people in the revolution as well as 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 got some. Before we conclude, would you tell us if the Washington Library has any special events or lecture series coming up that we should be aware of? Oh well, so everybody who loves uh, early American history should keep their eyeballs on the website of the Washington Library, which is right here at mountvernon.org/library. We have, even tonight, actually, we're recording this April 1st, we have uh, our Michelle Smith lecture series, Lori Glover, who's a professor at Missouri, is talking about founders as fathers, the private lives and politics of the American revolutionaries. And this lecture will be recorded, and it'll be live as well on live stream. But we have a whole series of books um, for the Michelle Smith lecture series. We have free book talks every month. We have a, a major conferences. So I have three conferences between now and and June 10th, uh, one is on leadership and in honor of James McGregor Burns, which is April 9th and 10th. And we have a decorative arts symposium, which is happening at the end of May at Mount Vernon, decorative arts and, and women in decorative arts in the founding era in particular, which is going to be fantastic at the library. And then uh, in early June, we're going to partner with the SAR, the Sons of the American Revolution, for their annual uh, conference, which is looking at the Marquis de Lafayette and the European Friends of the American Revolution. All these items will be recorded and available in live stream and afterwards. So uh, if they've already aired, you can watch them on the library website. And I think we're we're going to try to improve our ability to sort of have a central place where all our uh, recordings, both uh, audio and visual, are available for people. And I would just say, uh, yeah, just keep your eyes peeled because there's a lot coming in that regard. That's really fantastic. I mean, I'm always looking for an excuse to go to Mount Vernon, but, you know, Welcome. I can watch it on the web, which it, yeah. which is fantastic. It is. Yeah, it is. We really would love to grow our live streaming uh, because it is a way for, for us to, you know, share. the. We have a great opportunity to bring people here 
but I want to, you know, try to have an impact as large as possible and, and reach out to people who, who can't get here uh, to see what we're doing. And if you're active on Twitter, you could perhaps reach out uh, and, and engage with us as those things are happening. Now, you've mentioned your website and you've mentioned your Twitter account, both of which will be linked to in the show notes page for this episode. But is there any other place that people should look for more information about Mount Vernon, the Washington Library, and, and how to get in contact with you? Well, I think the website is the best way to go. The Twitter handle is great. We got a Facebook page at Mount Vernon as well as at the Washington Library here. That's another place where you can get some intimate connections, but feel free to reach out and connect with our librarians via email. I mean, their uh, email address is on the page, and if anybody wants to come here, like I said, it, we do like to have a heads up because we don't have the staff capability for everyone just to show up from the who's at the estate, but let us uh, give us some advance notice, and you can come here, read a book, come to one of our programs. Uh, that's a great way to get in touch with us, and then ultimately, the best way to be in touch with what we're up to here at Mount Vernon is to become a member of Mount Vernon. We are, uh, remember, uh, uh, take no funds from the government. We're all all funded from private accounts, and our members get uh, regular newsletters and regular updates and regular behind-the-scenes access to what we're doing here. At that sounds like the perfect gift for the Washington lover in your life. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Liz. Absolutely, it is. You should go for it. We have a brand-new... Uh, book we just published, uh, The Garden Book, uh, which is George Washington. Uh, his design of his landscape is a beautiful garden book, The General in the Garden. And so these kind of things you get to learn about if you remember and you're regularly engaged. Well, Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciated the intimate look at George Washington and his library. And it's, it's fantastic, all of the programs and uh, services you provide at the library in Mount Vernon. So thank you well, so much. Liz, thank you very much for having me. And let me just say uh, thank you for the work you do to try to continue to make history relevant in, in people's lives. We don't normally think of George Washington as a reader. But as Doug revealed to us, he was. Washington loved books and he loved learning. He wanted to create a place where Americans could come and use his books and papers. And thanks to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, we now have that place in the George Washington Library at Mount Vernon. I hope you'll check the library out during your next visit. In fact, now that we've learned about the library and all of the amazing things that it has inside, I want to go back to Mount Vernon. Tim and I visited about five years ago, and they didn't have the library back then. And I know we missed the distillery. I don't know how we missed it, but we, we missed the distillery and grist mills, and I want to go see those in action. What about you? Have you ever visited Mount Vernon? If so, what was your favorite memory? I think my favorite memory was the majestic view of the Potomac River. I mean, Washington had an awesome view, and that view to me is just part of the reason why Mount Vernon is a national treasure. Toward the end of our conversation, you may recall that Doug mentioned how Washington faced an Indian war in the Ohio Valley during his presidency. If this piqued your interest, you should check out episode 29, where Colin Calloway discusses this war and his book, the Victory with No Name. You can find more information about the George Washington Library, Mount Vernon, plus everything we talked about today, including Doug's list of George Washington book suggestions, on the show notes page for this episode. You'll find it all at benfranklinsworld.com slash 033. Have you told anyone about Ben Franklin's World this week? Please do. Word of mouth recommendations are the best way for us to help make the podcast visible and findable for our fellow history lovers. Finally, where do you listen to Ben Franklin's World? Take a picture or send me a note. You can post your responses in Poor Richards Club, our Facebook listener community. Tweet them to me at Liz Covart or answer my question via email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.